Let me ask this. How many people here have never celebrated Hanukkah? Wow. Well, in a couple of weeks, on a Tuesday night, right here, we're going to celebrate Hanukkah. And we have some very, very, very inexpensive Hanukkahs coming in and uh, inexpensive candles coming in for those uh, that want to participate. In a couple of days, we'll have them at the office, but we'll also have them available here that night uh, for those that wait till the last minute. But uh, we really encourage everyone. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Those that have not, uh, you know, attended a Hanukkah party with us or whatever, how many of you understand Hanukkah, what happened, what it's all about? How many of you don't have any clue about Hanukkah? All right, that's okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Hanukkah is extremely important. Remember the old saying, what goes around comes around. Okay, Hanukkah is going to happen again. And if you don't understand Hanukkah the first time, you're not going to know when it's happening the second time. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 24, which talks all about end time events, when you understand Hanukkah and you read it, you're saying, oh my goodness, this is Hanukkah happening all over again. But without understanding Hanukkah, you don't, you don't see that. So anyway, we'll be having some very, very inexpensive Hanukkahs and candles uh, being available. Another announcement I just wanted to make, uh, Art and Mari and their daughter Anastasia are leaving for Israel in the morning for about three weeks. And Donovan's going too. <laughs> That's right. And uh, so anyway, we want to be lifting uh, them all up in prayer. And uh, so that's what he's going to be. Okay, let's pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word, and for your Aleph Beit, uh, those Hebrew letters that make up your word. Father, I pray you'd give us open eyes, hearing ears, and hearts to understand. In Yeshua's name, amen. One of the things I want to mention, uh, this isn't my only source, but uh, it is a good part of the source of what I'm teaching on. We have this book called In His Own Words and, uh, by L. Grant Luton. And I think I put his name on your notes in the name of the book, and I think we have some available back there. And I think we have more at the office we can always bring. But I have a lot of different sources that I use. And what I want to do tonight, believe it or not, I was thinking, my goodness, there's so much more to the letter Aleph, you know, and we're already on the letter Bait. But then I realized, yeah, but I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> so what we're going to do tonight, uh, we're just going to go ahead and finish the Aleph some more. <laughs> Yay. And then we'll go into the Bait. And then the next time we meet, we'll finish the bait and go into the gimel, you know. But the nice thing is uh, we have all the time in the world, and we're just going to take our time because a lot of times I tend to go fast. Uh, really? <laughs> so I'm going to try to go a little bit slower, and we're just going to have fun looking at the different letters. And so I'm going to kind of finish the left. One of them, the PowerPoint was messed up the last time, so I have a PowerPoint uh, correction here. And then the other thing is I have some PowerPoints over something I just verbalized, but didn't have the PowerPoint for. And the PowerPoints are very effective. And I got to thinking because this is going to be videotaped, it's also good for the DVDs or for, or for the people that are watching online to be able to see it. So I'm going to uh, cover a little bit of that again. But let's go ahead and put up the first clip and you will see what I missed the last time. This, when God appeared to Moses at the bush and he declared what his name was, he actually said this was his name. He didn't say the yud he vav he at first. He said this right here. Eyeh, asher, eyeh, which is I am that I am. Really, that's not the best English translation per se, but uh, that's what we got. But here you have two words that are the same and the one in the middle that's different. And I want you to notice that the beginning of part of his name is all the letter Aleph. That's what I wanted to point out, Aleph, Aleph, Aleph. So you can really see how the Aleph stands for the Father. Now, so here is the Hebrew word for Father, Av, right? Daddy is Abba, 
And the bet and the vet are very the same, basically. Okay. And so again, here we have the name of the father, and it begins with the letter Aleph. So we think Aleph, we think of God the Father. Okay. And I want you to notice, because Hebrew is right to left, in the word father, you have the Aleph, which is the father. The bait represents the son, and he's on the right hand of the father. Okay. You notice that? And you're going to see why the letter bait represents the son, S-O-N. Okay. Now, here again is love, which is Ahav. And here you have the word for father, the Aleph and the bait. And right in the middle is the hey, which means to reveal, right? So love is the father being revealed. This is the heart of the father. And so that's what's really exciting when God is what? He's love. He is love. And so here we see in the Hebrew language, uh, that's the definition of love is revealing the father. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, we know father is of. Well, guess what mother is? M. Emma. M. And again, it begins with the letter Aleph because God has all the attributes. Okay? And so here we see mother. Now, the interesting thing is the letter Mem, which we're going to get to later. And if you'll notice, this is the closed Mem. It's not the open Mem. Just like you have a capital M or a small M, depending on if it's the first word in the sentence. In Hebrew, you have changes in some of the letters depending if it's the last letter rather than the first letter. So in this case, you have the closed mem. But what's interesting, do you, who knows what mem represents in the picture language? Water. Water. Now, do you remember what the aleph was? was what picture was represented by the aleph? The ox, which means strong, that which is strong. So here we see mother is strong water or the life-giving water. Here was the aleph, which was an ox. The mem was waves of water and the Hebrew word for water, mayim. They hear the M sound. So she is uh, strong water. Now here it is in the, uh, as the Hebrew letters evolved, this would have been more in David's time. You have the aleph, which is the ox and you have the mem. But you know what's interesting? How languages evolve. You get, you swip that around and mother is what? Ma. Look at that. You just flip the letters upside down and you get ma, which is a shortened verse for mom. But now look at this one, next one. Let me go back one. So let's look at the Hebrew word for mother. <clears throat> well, what's interesting, M is mother, the Aleph Mem, right? Do you know you put the letter noon on the end and you get the word faithful? So that's telling us that the mothers are the ones who are faithful. Matter of fact, can anybody read this word? Amen. That's what it is. And everyone says, Amen. Do you know the word amen comes from the root word of mother, meaning to be faithful? Isn't that interesting? And then there's amen. It comes from mother. I don't know how many of you do that. The word amen, root word of mother, someone who is, is to be faithful to their family. Well, if you look at this, it's the, the life of a mother because the letter noon, see, M is mother. The noon was, it means fish. It, it represents life, and it's a picture of a fish darting through water. And so we see faithfulness means the life of the mother. You following me? Is everyone getting that? That's what it's supposed to be. Truth. You got the root word of mother. It's emmet. Here's mother, and the tav means covenant. That's what it was. So it's the covenant of mother is truth. Here you see the ancient letters and the ancient tab used to be a cross. 
truth. And what's also interesting, just like, remember it's A to Z, alpha to omega, Aleph to Tav. The Aleph is the first letter, the Tav is the last letter, the Mem is the middle letter. Here you got the whole Aleph bet is truth. Now brother is what? Ach. You notice how all these are tied to the family. The brother, the mother, the father, they're all beginning with Aleph. It has to do with family, and it involves truthfulness and faithfulness. But here we have ach. Now, again, let's look at the ancient picture language. You had the ox, and the, the chet is a fence. A fence is like a border or something that protects. So a brother is to be a strong protector. Isn't that cool? That's what a brother is. It's a strong protector. Or a strong fence. Now look at this. And a family is supposed to dwell together in unity. And everyone's familiar with the word achad. Okay? So here you, again, you have the aleph representing the father. And then you have the, the chet, ach, which is brother. So unity comes, the dalet in the ancient Hebrew, you can even see it, it looks like a door. There's the top of the door, the side of the door. So uh, unity comes when you and your brother can go through the door together. You following me? Echad, unity. What, is the, what does the Lord say about unity? How pleasant it is when brothers dwell, go through the door together. See, so achad, brothers going through the door together. Okay. Now, last week I talked about how God is a consuming fire. And we had the letter aleph and the letter sheen. And the sheen in the ancient Hebrew looked like our capital W was fangs. And it means like teeth. It means to consume and destroy. So what do we know about fire? We know that fire is a strong devourer. A fire, what does it do? It consumes things. <clears throat> so here we have a, a fire, a strong devourer. Strong devourer. And God is a consuming fire. But if you remember the burning bush scenario, the bush was on fire, but it what? It wasn't consumed. Why wasn't it consumed, even though God is a consuming fire and a strong devourer? Because God was in its midst. Well, what do we see here? Here's the burning bush. I want to point this out. In Psalm 68, verse 4, it says, Sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah. This is the shortened version for Yahweh. Okay? And God's name, Yah, is written with a hand, and a window. The yud uh, is, is hand, and the he means to reveal. So it's the hand revealed. But this is his name, the yud and the he, Yah. Well, if we take a look here, in Genesis 127, it says God created man in his own image, okay? And that means both man and woman. Men were created in God's image, and women were created in God's image. And we'll look at that more in a little bit. But here, what do we have? The Hebrew words for man and woman or husband and wife are built around the word for fire. Why? Because we were created in his image. So if God is a consuming fire and we're created in his image, men and women are also consuming fires. Isn't that logical? Okay, so here's the word for man. You have the word for fire, the aleph sheen with the yud. And here you have the Hebrew word for woman, the aleph sheen, and you have the letter hey, ish and isha. Okay, in the ancient Hebrew, here's the aleph sheen, the strong devourer. The yud is a hand. So the definition of man, he's the one who works in the midst of the fire. Isha, you have the aleph sheen, and the hey means to what comes out of or to behold. So she is what the fire reveals. She's what comes out of the fire, what the fire produces. Now what's amazing about this 
is what happens, look at this, I wanna go back. When a man and woman get married, the man brings the letter Yud, the woman brings the letter Hey, and together that forms God's name Yah. And so man brings the youth to the relationship, a woman brings the hate to the relationship, and that's why they don't consume each other. But what happens when God is not in the relationship? All you have is fire and you consume each other. Isn't that fascinating? And you can see this all in the Hebrew language. It goes back to what I was talking about on Shabbat. Who was not here on Shabbat? How many people were not here on Shabbat? Okay, good, most of you were here, some of you weren't. <clears throat> All right, let's go to the next one. All right. So that's just a little bit more on the letter Aleph. Now, we're going to look at the letter Bait. So we're looking at a letter, remember. We're also looking at a picture. We're also looking at a word. We're also looking at a number. And what do you see here? You see a house. The amazing thing about a house, the letter Bait looks just like a house. You got the, the roof or the top of the house, you got a back wall, you got the foundation, the floor, and here's the door coming into the house. You can see how a house looks just like the letter bait. Do you see that? So we have bait in Hebrew means house. Okay, this is why, you ever heard of the place called Bethany? Which is really two words, Bethany, which means house of dates or the date house. How about Bethlehem, which is really Beit Lechem, and it becomes house of bread. Now, where was Yeshua born? Bethlehem, Beit Lechem. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread. Go figure. Didn't that make sense? Of course the bread of life would be born in the house of bread. But see, if you don't realize Beit means house, when you're reading these words, these names of these cities, you're, you're missing the, the really the deeper picture. Bethphage is the house of figs. Bethsaida is the fishing house. So if you'll, I want you to see those words, realize those are really two Hebrew words coming together. Now, let's take a look at this next picture here. Like I said, bait is also the number two, okay? The Aleph represents one, singularity. God is one. When you bring in bait, you're now bringing in duality, right? Plurality. <clears throat> in the ancient Hebrew, because bait meant house, Moses drew a three-room house for the letter. That was the letter bait in Moses' day. In David's day, it was a tent on a landscape. But you stand that up, you get our letter B, okay? So, but anyway, bait means house. So every letter is a picture, every letter is a number, and you can see that. So here's how you spell the letter bait. You hear the T on the end, the bait, the yud, and the tav. So that's the word bait. That's the letter bait, and that's how you spell the letter or the word for bait. All right, now let me ask you something. Is the Bible the Word of God? Okay. I think everyone here believes the Bible is the Word of God. What is the difference between the Scriptures and the Word of God? Think about it for a minute. When we hold up our Bible, this is the Scriptures, we say this is the Word of God. But what is the difference between the term the Scriptures and the term the Word of God? Spoken and written. The Word of God is what is spiritual, okay? Like the Holy Spirit, per se. The Word of God is spiritual and it's alive. Uh, most of you know you can take the scriptures out of someone's hand, but you can't take the Word out of their heart. Make sense? The scriptures are similar to the beautiful stained glass, and the Word is similar to the ray of sunlight that's coming through the glass. Well, we need to realize the word is a person. When you hold up your Bible, you don't see a person per se. You see letters written on pages. That's the scriptures. But the word of God is alive. It's Yeshua. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
And then in verse 14, it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So and that literally means to be tabernacling among us. Moses' tabernacle, just like it was made of animal skins and pillars and columns, okay? Yeshua came clothed with skin and bones. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, the Moses tabernacle was to be a representative of the body of Yeshua when he came. Just as we communicate to each other through words, God communicates with us through his word, which is Yeshua. That's how, because he's the word of God. So that's how God wants to communicate with us. Now, just as the Aleph represents the father, the bait represents the son. And you're going to see that tonight. As we go back to this picture, this is the first word of the Bible in Hebrew, Bereshit. And the bait is enlarged. It's real big compared to the other letters. All right. Well, <clears throat> there's a saying is, uh, and again, this is a midrash. And I don't know if you realize what I mean by midrash. Midrashes does, does not mean they are facts. Midrashes just mean this is uh, what the sages say that's very interesting and trying to communicate deeper truths. But anyway, they like to say that, you know, how come God started the, his word, the Bible, with the letter bait, not the letter aleph? Okay. Well, they, they say how all the letters went before the throne of God and said, oh, me first, me first. And they're all going through all the way down from Tav as it's working all the way down. They finally got to the letter bait. And the letter bait, uh, what's the Hebrew word for blessing? It's a bracha, which begins with what letter? The bait. So the bait says, hey, with me, all of your creation will use me to bless you. Is what they said, you know, because that's the word bracha. So God says, okay, fine. And then it came to the Aleph's turn, and the Aleph, of course, is a silent letter. It didn't say a word. And so the bait, God says, well, with you, we will bless all of mankind. But the letter Aleph, as I mentioned last week, he begins the Ten Commandments with the letter Aleph, or the Ten Words, actually. But there's more to it you're going to see here in a little bit. When you look at that letter bait, you'll notice... Again, it is closed at the top, it's closed at the back, it's closed at the bottom, it is only open to the front because Hebrew goes right to left. And so it's blocking everything from view that comes before it. But issuing forth from the door of the house are the words of the Torah in which are hidden the secrets of the Torah. So a lot of times people want to be consumed and concerned with what happened before creation. What was, what was the universe like before God created the heavens and the earth? And God has it closed because he's saying that is not your problem. <laughs> okay. Our, what we need to be concerned with is from Genesis 1-1, coming, what's coming on and what's coming forth from the house. And so when you consider this as a house and you, you see Yeshua is the head of the house as we're going to see all, Everything comes from him and proceeds from him. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42, Jesus said, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, last year I taught on this, and I think the year before I taught on this, but some of you were not here last year. I'm not going to do the whole teaching. But I'm just going to touch on some of the key things about this. Let's take a look. These, this is a picture of the Kotel, the Western Wall. And he, think of these big stones. Okay, when you think about it, if God created the world through words, right? I want you to think of, that means everything was created was created through words. So think of every word as a building block. Bereshit would be the first word, Bereshit. But look at this. Father is Av, right? We've learned that. We've learned that son is Ben, right? Well, what's the Hebrew word for stone? It's Aven. So the stone the builders rejected is the one stone that's made up of the father and the son. Okay, this is the stone the builders rejected. Now, I added something from last Shabbat. The stumbling stone for the Jews is Yeshua, right? And what's interesting is in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I'll also reject you. You shall be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the Torah of your God, so I'll forget your children. 
Hosea 13, 6, he says, according to their pasture, so were they filled, they were filled, and their heart was exalted, therefore they've forgotten me. And so again, we see the Torah and Yeshua are one and the same, right? And so what do we see here? The Christians stumble over Torah. But we all need to realize it's the same stone we're stumbling over. Okay? But let's take a look at Colossians 1, 16 through 18, which I think is quite incredible. It says, by him, or Yeshua, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I'm going to tell you some things that are just incredible here in a little bit that comes from uh, Judaism, what the sages say concerning this. And you're going to see a phenomenal tie into Yeshua. But first, let's look at this. Here is Genesis 1 1. Okay, you have Bereshit, Bara, Elohim, Et, Hashemayim, Viet, Haaretz. Sorry, but the Z got cut off there. But what do we have? In the beginning, created God, Aleph Tav, the heavens, and the earth. Well, you know what's amazing about this is when you go to the Gospels, and those of you that have the Hebrew Gospels that we have now, where you can see the Gospels in Hebrew, when you go to John 1, 1, this is what John was seeing. John saw this, these first seven words. And what is the fourth word? The Aleph Tav. Well, I'm going to show you the Gospel of John, the first seven words in Hebrew. And you're really going to see the parallel of what John saw when he saw this. Because I believe, anyway, that John wrote John, or actually his name wasn't John, it was Yochanan. But in Hebrew. Now watch the parallel. Okay, here it is. Bereshit, in the beginning, was the word. You see, ha-davar, okay? V and ha-davar, and the word was with Aleph Tav, or God. And what I think is interesting is the Aleph Tav is the fourth word, and the fourth word here is the word. He's saying the Aleph Tav is the Word. He is the Word of God. Now, let's go back to the beginning. Remember I said Yeshua is the cornerstone. So I have the picture of a cornerstone. In Hebrew, we have the word Bereshit. And you'll notice the first three letters of Bereshit is the complete word of the second word of Genesis, bara, which means to create. So here we have in the beginning created. Now, the amazing thing about this, and remember, if Yeshua is the cornerstone and Revelation says he was slain from the beginning of the world, you should be able to see he was slain from the word Bereshit. And I have a whole teaching when I, can, when I show you that. But look at this. What, who does, what does the Aleph represent? God, right? See this bar? Look at that. Bara, bara. What does bar mean? Son. So what do we have? We have the Son of God is the one who created all things. Right there in that word. We see it in the second word and we see it in the first three letters of the first word as well. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, who being the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Remember, we just got done reading in Colossians how everything was created for him and through him and by him. And remember last week I talked about how everything continues to exist because the word just keeps resonating. And here's another verse that just kind of shows that, how he continues to uphold all things by the word of his power. Well, listen to this. Now, this, is, this will rock your mind. If you put yourself into a Hebrew mindset back in Yeshua's day, right? 
The Jewish sages said that when God spoke the world into existence, his words were not only one-time commands, but continued to echo and pulsate like a song going through creation to continue to uphold the universe. Okay, that's what, when the Father spoke everything into existence, it just kept resonating. Well, think about this. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Yeshua said this, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. You know what they were hearing? In other words, Yeshua was saying, what the Father spoke at creation, the heavens and the earth, they're gonna pass away. But what I'm telling you will never pass away. He's saying, look, my words aren't gonna pass away even though God the Father's words will pass away, what he did, the heavens and the earth. So that's kind of interesting. If you were go to a, a lexicon or a Hebrew dictionary and you start with the letter Aleph, the first word is gonna be Av, which is father. Okay, because there's no A, A word, you know, and A, B is, is a two letter word, so it's father. Well, if you go to letter Bait, what do you think the first word in Hebrew is that you find with the letter Bait? Well, I have it on your notes, and it means an entrance to a building or the entry, right? And it comes from the Hebrew word bo, which means to go or to come. Well, what I think is interesting, the Bible in Genesis 1-1, when you think about one of the first things that happened, what did God say first? Let there be what? And you think of Genesis 1-1 was the entrance of God speaking. Think of the letter bait, and it's open, like I said, and God's words are coming forth. Look at Psalms 119-130. At the entrance of your words, or the entrance of your words, give what? And that's why one of the first things he said was, let there be what? And this is the beginning of the world. At the very beginning, he starts with the letter bait. And the first word of the letter bait means entrance. This is it. This is the beginning. And right here in Psalms 119, it says that the very entrance is what? Light. And it gives understanding to who? The next word is ba'ar, and it means to dig, which is why I like to call this sometimes Hebrew roots. To get to the roots, what do you gotta do? You gotta dig. But it also means to engrave, and it also means to explain or to declare, which is what happened in the beginning, Genesis 1-1. God began to speak and to declare at the very beginning, to make it plain. But that very same word, pronounced a little differently, same word though, also means a well. In Numbers 21, 16, and 17, and from there they went to Be'er, that is the well whereof the Lord spoke unto Moses, gather the people together, I will give them water, then sing this song, spring up a well, sing you unto it. So I think it's interesting, the first two words, one of them speaks of a fountain of living water, uh, like a well springing up. And then the other one has to do with an entrance or to enter. Well, I think that plainly speaks of Yeshua. Well, let's look at this. Here we have the word bara, which means to create. And some say it implies to create out of nothing. You know, there's a, there's a story of an a atheist you know, uh, who wanted to be in competition with God. And he said, I also can build a world and everything, you know, or I can build something. And he gets on the ground and starts to build something. And God says, use your own dirt, you know, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, but bara basically implies to be creating out of nothing. And you'll see that the Strong's number 15 or 1254, which I said earlier refers to like the son of God. Well, you also have the Hebrew word bana. Now, I want you to notice it has a hay on the end, but it means to build. And the first use is in Genesis 2.22, where it talks about, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, built he a woman. So in other words, he created, you know, Adam out of the dust. He created the world out of nothing, Adam just out of dust, but then he built a woman. Well, it's interesting that that same word in Aramaic is bana, or bana, and it says here, it corresponds to that same Hebrew word, which means to build. 
And then there, Bana, which means to build, you also again have the Son of God. So here we see the Son of God is the one who created all things out of nothing, and the Son of God is the one who built all things, which goes right back to what we were reading in Colossians. Look at Ezra 5.2. It says, Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Yeshua, the son of Josedach, and he began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. There's that word. And look at Hebrews 11.10. Talking about Abraham, he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. These are two different words, the builder and the maker. And we see by both Bara and Bana, the son of God was the builder and the maker of all things. Now here's another thought. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Yeshua said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he'll be saved and he'll go in and out and find pasture right? So he's the gate of the pen. So here's the letter bait. We've got the little sheep inside. The sheep are free to roam within the confines of the sheep pen, right? And the shepherds at night would sleep at the entrance of the bait. That way the sheep had these three walls around them to protect them. They were free to roam within. At night when the shepherd pinned them up, he would sleep across the opening of the gate to make sure the sheep who couldn't jump over the walls, if they tried to crawl over them, he'd wake up and say, you get back in there. He'd also be in there to protect them from any uh, outside harm. Okay, now when released during the day, though free from the sheepfold, they now must walk in obedience to the shepherd. Okay, the shepherd isn't just going to let them go crazy. They have, he ha he's watching over them. They have to stay in obedience to the shepherd. Both the shepherd and the pen themselves provide protection. But following the shepherd is much more exciting. You know what I'm saying? Well, the walls of the sheep pen are, are like the written Torah, an external restraint. But obedience to the shepherd is internal. And it's more demanding and more demanding, but much more exciting. So I want you to think of the letter bait in one sense, the three walls as the confines of the Torah. It's just like a fence protecting a child from playing in the street, okay? But if once the parent knows the child is gonna obey them when they leave the fence, then they can have the freedom of being outside of the fence. Does that make sense? And that's what's so important. Torah isn't, uh, you, you need to see Torah in a different light. It's there to protect us. Uh, I'm going to go off on a tangent. I wasn't going to go on. But you know how it says the law was the schoolmaster? Okay. That's kind of what I'm talking about. But what people don't understand when they hear that term, the law is the schoolmaster, they say, well, we're not under a schoolmaster anymore. Well, I tell you what, the, what is the purpose of the schoolmaster? It's to train you how to brush your teeth when you're a kid, how to do all these things. The reason you don't need a schoolmaster is because you now know how to brush your teeth. And when you learn how to brush your teeth, you don't go shoot the schoolmaster. Okay? So the, what we need to realize is the, the whole purpose of the schoolmaster was to put the Torah on the inside. Now you don't need the schoolmaster, not because you don't need the Torah. It's because you've internalized it. I mean, this is such a simple explanation. Now look at this. This is kind of incredible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Let's look at this. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. He divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the what? Second day. Now, bait is the number what? And bait means what? House. Okay, so on the second day of creation, God created a house for the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. You following me? Isn't that cool? Now, do you know what the second commandment is? The second commandment is, don't make yourself any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven or in the earth or that is in the water beneath the earth. Do you see the parallel to the second commandment? Now, Bait, like I said, Aleph represents one, bait represents two, or duality. Look at this here. Here's the Ten Commandments uh, in Hebrew. Now, here's what's amazing. I don't know if you guys realize this. 
But we've got five commandments on one tablet, five commandments on the other tablet. You know, you got the ones for God, the one for mankind, right? Well, the letter bait represents duality, okay? Well, look at this. The first, I want you to see how they compare one to the other. The first commandment was simply, I am the Lord, okay? And the first commandment on the other half is, don't kill. Why? Because Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man, okay? So he's saying, I am the Lord, okay? And over here, don't destroy what has been created in the image of God. Look at the second commandment. You're to have no strange gods before me. And what is the seventh commandment? Don't commit adultery. These are parallel. You're going back and forth. You're gonna see this the whole way uh, down as we go, as we do the gimel and the dalad and the hay the next time we meet. Or you can go on your own and take a look at that before we get there. But here, God created the heaven and the earth. Man and woman, light and darkness, this world and the world to come. So there's the duality, only God is one, okay? But when it came to creation, he created everything in a, in a duality, back and forth, back and forth. But the amazing thing we need to realize, the heavens need the earth, the earth needs the heavens. Man needs woman, woman needs the man, okay? Harmony in creation involves contrasting phenomena. Heaven gives the light and the rain, the earth receives it and produces fruit. The heaven can't say to the earth, I'm greater than you. Well, I'd like to see the sky produce an apple, okay? Adam and Eve were not complete without each other either. Here's something else that's interesting regarding how nature responds, the heavens and the earth and the like. In Leviticus 26, one through five, it says, you shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up an image of stone in your land to bow down to it. I'm the Lord your God. You're to keep my Sabbath, you're to reverence my sanctuary. You know, that's kind of an interesting thought because we are to be a sanctuary, right? You're to reverence my sanctuary, I am the Lord. He says, now look at this. If you walk in my statutes, you keep my commandments and do them. Then I will give you rain in due season and the land will yield her increase. The trees of the field will yield her fruit. Your threshing shall reach to the vintage. The vintage shall reach to the sowing time and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I don't know if you realize what this is saying. The weather report is based on obedience. The weather report is based on obedience. Think about that. Nature, God is saying, you think it's based on something that the weatherman says? God says, no, the weather report is based on how you respond and the earth will respond and the heavens will respond. When you obey my word, everything comes into harmony. You're gonna get the rain you need, okay? You're gonna produce fruit. It all, that's why walking in Torah when you just get in the habit of walking into it, after a while, everything comes into harmony. It all comes in sync. It's the greatest chiropractor in the world. Okay, everything just comes in alignment. Nature responds. Do you realize that? Nature responds when God's laws are observed. It's like the, the, the person in Israel could say, sorry, everyone's disobeying. There'll be no rain today. Genesis 3, 17 and 18. What did God say to Adam? Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten of the tree, which I commanded you saying, don't eat of it. The ground is what? Cursed. So now the earth is going to respond to Adam's sin. And for the uh, woman, he said, I'm going to greatly multiply your sorrow in, in conception. And in sorrow, you bring forth your children. So by observing Torah, we can cause numberless forces of nature to function harmoniously with us. That's an incredible thought. That really is an incredible thought. Now here's another thought that's just kind of mind blowing. It's, some of these things are hard to wrap your head around. 
Listen to this statement here. This is what the sages taught. That one hour in the world to come is worth more than the entire life of this world. One hour in the world to come is just, remember the Lord said himself, eye has not seen, ear has not heard what he has prepared for us, right? So the sages would say one hour in the world to come is worth all the lives in this world. But you know what they said in contrast? On the other hand, they said, there is nothing, nothing in the world to come that can match one hour of a human living out Torah in this world. Now, did you catch that? And I'm gonna tell you the reason why they said that. They said there is nothing, on the other hand, even though one hour in the world to come is worth all the lives of this world, there's not one hour in the world to come that can match one hour of studying Torah in this lifetime, in this world. Why is that? Here's the reason why, and I'm gonna give you a New Testament scripture to bracket it up. They said, because only in this world can you earn rewards in the world to come. Now is the only time you can earn rewards. Once you enter the world to come, you cannot perform even one more mitzvah to increase your share there. Game over. Test is over. How many of you are in grade school or in high school, you had time test, you had to take the test, put your pencils down, game over. Once game is over, is there anything you can do to correct or to... God created this world to give you the chance to earn as many rewards as you can in the world to come. That's why he said, nothing of that world can compare to one hour here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. If any man build on this foundation, gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work will be made manifest for the day will declare it because it's revealed by fire, and the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide in which he built thereon, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work will be burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will still be saved. You're still saved, you're still going to heaven, yet so as by fire. And so think about this. The test is now. Once you pass away, and we don't know if it's going to be today, tomorrow, the next day, the next week, we, none of us can count how much time we have in this test that God has put us here. But he wanted to give us the opportunity in this world to get as much reward as we can in the world to come. But once we pass away, it's game over, guys. So that means, what do we want to be doing now? The commandments. The mitzvot, the thing God wants us to do. Do you see why the devil wants you to be robbed? He's a robber. He's trying to steal you of everything from the world to come. This world was created to provide us an opportunity to reach the highest possible place we could in the world to come. Now, with that in mind, now think about this too. With that in mind, that should put a new incentive in us to... Man, I'm, I, I don't think we really realize how it's right now and this time we are building for the world to come. We're not building for right now. We're, we're you know, putting in the bucket for the kingdom to come. All right? Now think about that. With that in mind, the ultimate, the ultimate thing is going to be Jacob's trouble. Okay? I, you know, a lot of the tribulation or whatever you want to call it, the, this great time of testing. That's why, again, I say, don't take me out of the game, coach. Put me in. I think this is going to be the greatest time to earn as many merits or rewards as possible. And I don't necessarily do it for the rewards of the merit. I just do it because God wants me to do it. For heaven's sake, why would you want to be taken out? I want to stay here as long as I can. Now, again, look at the last part of that verse in 1 Corinthians three sixteen. In the context... He says, don't you know that you're the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? That means you are a house, right? You're a house. You're a letter bait. You are a letter bait. You are a house. And the spirit of God has to be in your house. We're a temple. Now, bait means house, alluding 
to the focal point of holiness on earth. Okay? When you think of, when I think of bait, I think of the house of God, right? Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of the world, the center of the universe for that matter. And God wanted, you know, there's a house there, the temple, so to speak. That was to be the center of holiness. And when you think of that, and we're to be the temple of God, holiness should be the focal point of our life, right? Look at Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where in the world are you going to have room to build a house for me? And where is the place of my rest? All those things my hand has made. And all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is a poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. God says, that, you know where I'm going to rest? My house is going to be resting in a person who has holiness and he's humble. That's where God wants to rest. We were created to be miniature sanctuaries for God. Miniature sanctuaries. Now, let me ask you something. What's the difference between a house and a home? Uh, yeah, yeah, a home is where the heart is, okay? There's a big difference. Do you know that I have on your notes, the Hebrew word for house is bait, right? That's what we said. Each letter is a number. The Torah, the Tav, the letter Tav is worth 400. The Yod is 10. The Bait is 2. So the word house is 412. Now the word for temple or Mikdash, the numerical value is 444. Do you know the difference between those two numbers, between a house and a home or a temple, is 32, which is the numerical value of Lev, which is heart? Isn't that pretty cool? By putting your heart into your house, it can become a sanctuary in miniature. Very, very fascinating. Now the other thing, when you think about the Hebrew word for heart, which is lev, the first letter is the lamed, the second letter is the bait, and the bait means house. The lamed represents a shepherd's staff to control or authority. So what that tells us is love is what's to control the house. The heart is what, love is heart. The heart is what's to control the house, to have authority in the house, that, that heart of love. Isn't that interesting? I mean, this kind of stuff just amazes me. Now, uh, the next thing on your notes, I have, if you remember, I said Psalms 119. First eight verses were said around the Aleph. The next eight verses are going to be centered around the word bait. And so I just have kind of like uh, verse 9 through 11 here. But you can see in the Hebrew, the very first word begins with the letter bait. And I think it's interesting when you think of bait as house, right? And the difference between a house and a sanctuary is the heart, right? And look at the words here of the letter bait in honor of the letter bait. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word with my whole what? Heart have I sought you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've hidden your word where? In my heart. And the letter bait means to be inside. That's why the very first word in Hebrew, bereshit, is in the beginning. The letter bait is the word in. Reshit is the beginning or the first fruits. And so it's hiding that word in our heart is what's going to make the difference between a house and a home or a miniature sanctuary for God. That, to me, this is just incredible. Now, here's the interesting thing about that word, bereshit. Okay, if you remember, bereshit means what? In the beginning. That's the first word in Genesis 1.1. If you remember, the first letter was the bait, and then hooked to that letter bait is the word reshit. Well... Reshit implies not only the first, as in the, the word the beginning, but it also implies the very purpose of creation. In other words, instead of saying in the beginning, I'm going to give you some different ways of looking at this, because the word Hebrew word reshit also means first fruits, okay? And the letter bait not only can mean in, it can mean for 
or on behalf of, or because of. So you also could read that word Bereshit, where we get the word in the beginning, as saying for Reshit. I want you to think of Reshit as Yeshua. Reshit is the first fruits of the creation. So in other words, that word Bereshit could also mean for Reshit, or for the first fruits, or for Yeshua, or because of Reshit. When you go back to Colossians, what did it say? It was for him all things were created. When they're saying it's for him, by him, through him, they're re- they keep repeating the same word, Bereshit. It's for Reshit, by Reshit, through Bereshit. All of that they're saying, in that, that's what they see in that one word. Reshit is anything that is preeminent in testifying to the greatness of the creator. You following me? Reshit means that which is preeminent, that which is first. So, look at Revelation 4.11. It says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. For your pleasure they are and were created. So everything in the beginning was created for who? For Reshit. That's why the Bible begins, Bereshit, for Reshit, for Yeshua, for the first fruits. That's why everything that you're seeing is proceeding from him, for him, and by him. And you see all of that in that one word, beginning with the letter bait. This is what, when, when you're reading the New Testament, this is what they're seeing. They're looking at that word, Bereshit. Now, Torah is wisdom. Torah is Reshit. Let's look at this next clip. Here's that word, Bereshit. Bait is in, Reshit is the first fruits or the beginning. But again, at the very beginning, you have what? Bar. Bar is son in Daniel 3.25, is in Bar Mitzvah. But what's crazy, the word bar in Genesis 41.49 also means grain. Leviticus 23.10, it talks about bringing the first fruits of your grain offering. That's Yeshua. 1 Corinthians 15.23 says Yeshua was the first fruits. So in that word, bray sheet, we see Yeshua is the son of God who created all things, and he's also the grain of the first fruits offering. In the temple, here you have the bait you tob, which is bait, which is house. So you see all of that right there in that one word. Let me go to the next clip for a second. Now remember I equated Torah with wisdom, right? And Torah is Reshit, or that which is first. Look at Proverbs 31, 26. It says, she opened her mouth with wisdom. Now remember, Danny ben talked about this. I've also mentioned it several times in Hebrew poetry. They say the same thing twice in two different ways. Is everyone familiar with that? That's what's happening here. Look at Proverbs 31, 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Okay, mouth and wisdom, tongue and Torah of kindness. So we see the wisdom and Torah go together. Look at Proverbs 13, 14. The Torah of the wise is a fountain of life. Okay, so here we see the Torah of the wise. Torah and wisdom go together and what do they bring? Life. Now look at Psalms 19, 7 concerning the Torah. The Torah of the Lord is what? Okay, well, why in the world are we trying to find flaws with Torah then? And it says, and what does it do? It what, does what? Converts the soul. Oh, my goodness. How many conversions do we want? We want lots of conversions. Well, let's throw out the Torah. Well, how do you expect to get the conversions in? True conversions come through Torah. The Torah of the Lord is perfect. That's what converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So again, we see Torah is what brings wisdom to the simple. Look at Proverbs 8, 22 through 30. Here, this is wisdom talking, but I want you to create wisdom with Torah. I just showed you how Torah and wisdom go together. So I want you to read this as Torah. The Lord possessed me in the beginning. Does that sound familiar, Bereshit? of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. That means before the earth was created, that phrase in the beginning, what existed beforehand? Torah pre-existed. Torah even pre-existed in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Can you read how this is all before creation? Well, as yet he had not even made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, Torah was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters would not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundation of the earth, Torah was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So we see Torah is Rashid, Torah is first. But look at this, Israel is also Rashid. We even find it in Jeremiah 2, 3. Israel was holiness to the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend, evil will come upon them, saith the Lord. Wow. Look at Jeremiah 33, 23 through 26. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, consider not what this people have spoken. Now these are the nations that are saying this. And what did they say? The two families which the Lord has chosen, he hath even cast them off. Sounds like replacement theology. Thus they have despised my people that they should be no more a nation before them. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinance of the heaven and the earth, and it goes on, Jeremiah 33. But you know how one sage read that phrase, if my covenant, what covenant do you think he was talking about? Torah. And he's talking about day and night, and he's talking about the ordinance of heaven and earth. Here's how they rephrase that verse. Well, uh, let me see. If not for my covenant or Torah to be studied day and night, I would not have established the ordinances of heaven and earth. When you realize that Rashid is Torah and Rashid came first, that means God created the heavens and the earth and put humans on it so they could learn Torah. There would be no need for heaven and earth and humans if we were not going to give glory to God. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. And so what did he do? Then he created the nation of Israel to be the first to have the Torah. And they were to take the Torah to the nations. I mean, this is incredible. So Israel also is Rashid. It, it, then, then look at the next few verses. It says, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of the seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, he's saying, look, it ain't going to happen. He says, if my covenant, if, if, if I destroy the Torah, he's saying, then I'll destroy Israel. Well, guess what? That ain't happening. He says, I'm going to cause their captivity to return and I'm going to have mercy on them. First Chronicles 17, 21 and 22. He says, and what one nation in the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem to be his own people, to make you a name of greatness and terribleness by driving out nations from before your people whom you have redeemed out of Egypt. For your people Israel did you make your own people forever and you, Lord, became their God. Torah is Rashid, Israel is Rashid. And we too become Rashid when we're grafted into Israel. But when you see the importance of Torah and its wisdom and its possible conversions, can you see why Satan wants people to have nothing to do with Torah? It's this great big cloud of like the Wizard of Oz, all the raw, and then you see behind it is just this stupid little squirrely person. Here's what's kind of interesting. What do you see here? What is this? Aleph, Beit, Dalet. That sounds like the letters of the Aleph Bet, doesn't it? Well, you know what's interesting? The Beit stands for who? Yeshua, the son, right? Well, if you take the Beit out of the Aleph Beit, you have Aleph, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, which is Agadah, which is the story. So here we have the son who's going to tell us the story of all of creation. Pretty cool. 
exactly like the Haggadah for Passover. Okay, so that's what I had for the letter bait so far. And there's more. So what we'll do when we meet in a few weeks again, we'll finish up the letter bait and go to the gimel. Now we have a few minutes and I'm going to answer a few questions. On Monday nights, we want to also answer questions. And so let's take a quick look. We, we're getting tons of questions from all over the world. Let's see. Um, okay, here's one question. How does the menorah represent Christmas and Christ? Okay. The menorah does not represent Christmas. But the menorah does represent Christ. And you see that in, in the Revelation. And uh, John, what did he see? He saw a menorah, one in the middle, like into the Son of Man. And when you look at Genesis 1 1, you'll see there's seven words, just like there's seven lamps on a menorah. So Yeshua definitely is represented by the menorah, and it does not represent Christmas. <laughs> this one is, I, you're going to know it's from a serious Catholic. Okay? And he says, in light of Yeshua's words, 2,000 years ago about Holy Communion or 2,000 years of the same belief along with all the Orthodox churches that have a priesthood and altars. They believe in the real presence and many miracles through the ages. Why don't you? Many church fathers talk of this and find no one disputing it. Why were Christians called cannibals by the Roman pagans in the first century? Why did they make the sign of the cross as they were thrown to the lions? He said, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink and other scriptures do too. Thanks for your help in this matter. Okay. Well, um, I was raised a Catholic to begin with. And Yeshua after this, he basically was saying, my words to you are spirit and life. Okay, I don't think that the Eucharist literally is transubstanti transubstantiation turns into the literal food or body and the blood turns to the, or the wine turns to literal blood. First off, in the Hebrew mindset, they were told not to eat blood. Okay, so, but anyway, um, just because something's been done a long time too doesn't make it right. You know, you can, you can be two degrees off and 2,000 miles later, right. that two degrees is way off. And you can get off a little bit 2,000 years ago and you're going to find your way off 2,000 years later. Anyway, I do believe in Yeshua's real presence and I do believe in miracles. Okay. What are the consequences if one observes the Sabbath on Sunday instead of Saturday? Is there any place in the New Testament that says the apostles changed the day of worship to Sunday? Okay, this is important also. I really believe so. And here's the reason why. First off, nowhere, nowhere, nowhere does it say they changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Okay? But they don't understand on the day of worship. When they, he says the apostles changed the day of worship. They didn't change any of the days of worship. Every day was the day of worship. Hello. There's nothing wrong with going to church on Sunday. There's nothing wrong with worshiping God on Sunday. They worship seven days a week. As a matter of fact, God required them to worship him seven days a week. Every day they had to have the morning sacrifice. They had to have the evening sacrifice. They would bring, bring sacrifices. So there's nothing wrong with going to church on Sunday. Okay. It just doesn't make it the Sabbath. That's the important thing to remember. Sunday is not the Sabbath. It was never changed to the Sabbath. Saturday is always the Sabbath. It always has, always will be. And so, but that doesn't mean you can't go to church on any other day of the week. You following me? Does that make sense? Because oftentimes people, they, st they start bashing people who go to church on Sunday. You can't bash people who go to church on Sunday. You can rest on Shabbat and go to church on Sunday. 
You can fellowship with like-minded believers on Shabbat and still go to church on Sunday. As a matter of fact, here at El Shaddai, we have a lot of people who go here on Shabbat and they have a church they go to on Sunday. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, it just, just realize Sunday's not the Shabbat. On Shabbat, they would do extra sacrifices than they did on Saturday. So you can't get on people's cases who go to church on Sunday. Okay, uh, every day, I mean, it'd be great if there was people meeting every day of the week. So that's really important for people to realize that. But they didn't change. I mean, and, and I'll just bring this up too. A lot of people say, well, um, you know, Jesus is my Sabbath, or every day is the Sabbath. Or, but you can't, you can't, that's not true. The reason why is this. God's, the commandment was to keep the Sabbath what? Holy, right? And what does holy mean? Set apart. Set apart. If every day is holy, nothing is holy. And you know what? You're going to see in a couple weeks when I go to the Sabbath is the one commandment and the duality of the other commandment. Do you know what the other commandment that parallels keeping the Sabbath is? Don't bear false witness. As far as when the Sabbath is. We have some interesting parallels here, guys. All right? All right, but it's interesting. Okay. Let me see. I'll try to answer one more question. Well, is there anyone here that has a question? Okay. I see that hand. Let me, I want to give time for a couple of questions here. This light is on, so I'm assuming it's on. Okay. Now, y'all don't laugh at this. But this has been bothering me for quite some time, and I'd really like some clarification. On Deuteronomy 5.8. Hold the mic close. Where you said, thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. You shalt not make thee any graven image. Does that, you know, in America and all over the world, it's common in a household in today, today's world, to have decorator items, or in some a cases... A big old fish hanging on the wall you caught. <laughs> or or in, in a lot of us have a collection. I'm an artist, so I have a, a little collection of figurines that are artists. Um, and I've really been troubled by that since I read this and studied it, and I feel like maybe I should be getting rid of those. What's your take on this? I mean, what, how, do you think we should be getting rid of anything that's an image? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I, don't, I personally may look at it different than some people. I don't have a problem necessarily with it. I mean, obviously, it's not an idol that you're not bowing down right. and worshiping. You know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with it. Uh, I could look into it more detail and maybe give you a better detailed answer. But just off the cuff, I don't think that you have to worry about... I mean, it also says the word pictures. Don't have pictures. Well, that doesn't mean everyone that has a camera and takes pictures and is an idolater. You know what I'm saying? I mean, God looks at your heart. But I, I wouldn't say you know i think it's it's going to be it may be different for different people i mean what the purpose of it is and the hindu religion it may be a completely different reason why they do it so i'd have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis matthew just one comment i think it's a heart issue it's a you know god's not saying that you have to get rid of it it depends on where you, where is your heart you know do you do you heart after all of those or are they more of a, you know, where is your heart? The way, the way I look at it along that line, and you guys can look at it, you know, however you want to look at it. But here's the thing. For example, and this is where we have to be real careful. Let's say, uh, and this is my typical example. Let's say you play the French horn. Okay, you love your French horn. But if your French horn is taking up all of your time away from your spouse, away from your family, it's becoming an idol. And so God may tell you to set that French horn down. But that doesn't mean you can go around and tell everyone they have to give up French horns. God is speaking to you about your situation with your French horn. 
You see what I'm saying? And so that's what I think it is on a lot of these things. We have to realize when God speaks to us, that doesn't mean he's speaking to everybody on what he's dealing with us on. Okay? What uh, one person's idol may not be the other person's idol. So that's why I'm saying it's going to be a case-by-case basis. Any other questions? Over there, there. And then we'll pray. What's your name? My name, that is an excellent question. Believe it or not, I have a very interesting name. Because, well, I'll tell you a funny story. As a Catholic, we're given a confirmation name too when I was a kid. Well, my name is Mark Matthew. And so I had to find a confirmation name. And when, you know, only like in first grade, I think, I don't remember now when you see First Communion. And I was trying to find out what my confirmation name should be. So my older brothers and sisters, well, pick one of the other gospel writers. Well, I didn't know who they were. So I said, well, who are they? And they go, you know, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. So I said, okay, I want to be Lucan. <laughs> and they said, no, it's not Lucan, it's Luke and John. So anyway, my name is Mark Matthew Luke Biltz. That is my name. So, okay. Well, let's stand. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Vinu Mulcano, our Father, our King, we thank you so much for your Aleph Beit. It's your word. These are your letters. You created everything, which means you created this language. And I believe it's the language of heaven. Father, I pray you would just speak to each one of our hearts that we do truly make our temples from a house into a home. With all of our heart, we love you. That's what you said. We're to love you with all of our heart. And it's that heart that makes the difference. And so, Father, I pray that we will learn to love one another as well. Just give everyone a safe trip home. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.